Mark Rapley from the Garden Recruitment. Um, should, I, should I be worried by the fact that there was really only one advert, well, not even an, an advert, there was a reference to the Cadbury's ad, but other than that, I was beginning to think that I was back at university. Uh, maybe metaphysics was the topic, or maybe psychology was the topic, or maybe it was neuroscience, or maybe it was market research, but was, are, are there any examples of great advertising campaigns which have emerged from these different approaches, which I imagine are aimed at getting great advertising campaigns? Yeah, well, I suppose the, the obvious one for the herd, uh, since, since that's where I'm putting my million pounds, was, uh, was Hotmail. You know, and it's, it's, we don't think of it as an advert, but the yeah. act of sending an email spread the, the very thing that they wanted to, to spread. And, and I, I often think some of the best examples, when you line them up, step outside of the formal discussions of we've made a TV 30-second commercial. And, you know, it's, it's, it's these things that break the rules and, and start to actually tap into the way people uh, operate. My one would be the fourth emergency service, which was a perfect example of framing, of changing the comparative set. Uh, my, my example would be 118118 because that was a masterpiece of psychological engineering contained within that ad for a very dull, let's face it, just telephone directory, was, were, was aspects of psychology, like chunking, anthropomorphizing, uh, the, the way the music was used, all that sort of thing, right, Com completely uh, allowed 118118 to dominate that field and gain a huge market share. It's a very clever ad, psychologically. Well, the, the, thing I, the thing I just add is, by making the claim that it's instinct and gut feel that makes great advertising, you will at least curry the favour of your creative department. <laughs> uh, uh, my, 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 my experience is that uh, there is a definite herd effect there where the latest art directional style is simply driven by whatever's in the window of magma that week. So, uh, so but I, there, is, there is a role, uh, there is clearly, clearly a role for, uh, for, for instinct, and, uh, and if you get it right, I mean, I think most really, uh, I feel a lot of truly great uh, campaigns have had instinct and gut feel at the heart of them at some level. No, retro, you say retrofit like it's a bad thing, Mark. <laughs> I also say, if planning is not preemptive post-rationalization, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Richard from DARE. A question to uh, neuroscience and behavioral economics. Um, I was wondering if when, when you take, uh, take people out of the lab and into a real world context, if you can really actually provide a real explanation for what's going on, and if you can drill down um, a decision context, to, let's say if we're looking at framing, whether it's comparing them to other tea bags or to the coffee shop they walked past in the morning or the website they saw five minutes ago, or in neuroscience, if you see, uh, if you see a change, uh, how, how can you predict um, whether that uh, piece of, uh, the, the tiny piece of brain activity that you've seen is down to an argument that someone's had this morning or whether it's down to the coffee they've had? You know, the, the kind of, the real world context is so complicated. Um, what are we really, what can you really say? Although you can provide a great post explanation probably for why, uh, for why these things have happened, what can we say that kind of, uh, guides the way we should be acting. You want to go first? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I would never say that there is going to be any model of human behavior which is going to be perfectly predictive, but it patently tells you where you might want to experiment and ask questions. I mean, a story, a very, very simple story from a car manufacturer in Germany where they're going to knock 3,000 euros off the purchase price of a car. Someone, relatively junior, had done behavioral economics who said, would this be more effective if you made it 3,000 euros on the trade-in price of your old car? Now, their first reaction was, well, it's exactly the same, isn't it? If you're an economist, it is. However, he persuaded them to test it. The difference in the test was so pronounced that when they rolled it out nationally as a $3,000 um, add-on to your trade-in price, which may be a framing effect, by the way. 3,000 euros on top of 6,000, which is what you expect to sell your car for, seems a much bigger amount than 3,000 euros knocked off a 22,000 euro purchase price. 
But let's not worry about the post-rationalization. What behavioral economics said is, although to any economist this is apparently an identical offer, it is not an identical offer to human beings. They tested it. The net effect when, the, when Plan B was rolled out nationally in Germany was to sell another 24,000 cars. So is it perfectly predictive? Would I have the confidence to say, you should never do that? Possibly not. But does it actually provide me with some really good ammunition for saying this is worth testing? Does it provide me, by the way, with ammunition which I would have said if offered the chance by any mobile phone operators to say, you are absolutely insane in paying 16 billion for a 3G license in the UK because the comparative frame for paying for broadband is home broadband which is unmetered. Therefore, you will never be able to charge people by the megabyte, as you believe. The whole business plan for those 3G auctions was based on an assumption of human behavior and what people would pay for, which was fundamentally erroneous once you understood a bit of behavioral economics. So, uh, you know, is it a per does it actually render all, all human behavior utterly predictable? I hope not, really. Um, but does it really ask, encourage you to ask really, really interesting and new questions? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I can add to that from the neuroscience perspective that um, one of the things we often get asked is um, are you sure that the kinds of things that you see in a scanner translate into the real world? And um, there's several answers to that. The, the one that I'm going to select tonight is that we've recently been doing some uh, work combining eye tracking uh, in the scanner in a, virt in, in a real shopping scenario. So whilst you're immersed in there, you're actually, you, you can't actually see that you're in an fMRI scanner. What you see using uh, fiber optic cables and a 180 degree field of view is yourself as if you're walking down the supermarket aisle. You can direct yourself with joysticks and so forth. Right. And interestingly, and we, this is what we're developing with TMS, I should, I should say that because I have clients in the, <laughs> in the audience. Um, uh, and what, you, what was very interesting was that the eye tracking trace even though people are in an immersed environment, was near identical to what uh, you see in uh, the eye tracking trace of people in a real supermarket. So placed in, an, in a, a context where go out and shop, people tend to just do that and you'll see them go into this habitual mode. And uh, because a lot of our behavior is in habitual mode, um, you can then see the relationship and the generalization of not only where you're looking now and fixating, so that's kind of useful from an eye tracking perspective, but we're now able to say, well, what are you thinking then when you fixate at particular points in space? Oh, um, hi, Stephen Plaster, uh, design intern at Moving Brands. Um, tonight here you've presented us with five very convincing and five very different methods of um, human behavior measuring human behavior, do you not think it's time that we merged all five of them together rather than trying to separate them? Um, because at the end of the day, they've all seemed to have yielded positive results in how we measure human behavior. In yeah, I'd vote for that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm happy to, to say that. I think yes is the, is, is the short answer, and uh, yes is also the longer answer, but with some qualification. Is it? I think it's a question of order, and I just pick up on Alex's earlier question as well. We have, it's, you don't just have to be right in this business, you have to convince a client you're right. And one of the uh, advantages, you, you do know, as a planner you know, one of the ways you can judge the success of your presentation is how many sound bites did the client write down to sell it to their boss. Right? And it's you're just that you're providing a, a sort of product. You've made it intuitive, you've provided that description which makes it make sense and they feel that no one can argue against it. And in my observation of working with behavioral economics, both with, uh, with our IPA members and with clients, is it has the great advantage of being incredibly intuitive. You hit them with a few convincing anecdotes, you explain the principle, they want to go for it. And that's brilliant because you can get movement. Now with other stuff like uh, you know, very complex research techniques and neuroscience, these things can uh, uh, give great insight, but they have the, have the problem that they need a bit more of a run-up. Uh, and that somewhat limits the number of clients you can necessarily convince. With clients you can convince, it works brilliantly. So I think there is a question of all of these things are useful. I know, I'm sorry to be so conciliatory, but there you are, that's no, how it is. is. Yeah. Uh, but there is a question of selling it and finding a client that you can convince. And uh, the ability to make something intuitive is, 
a great advantage in achieving that very pragmatic aim. And at the end of the day, it is quite a pragmatic thing. And then finding clients who are willing to have a long and intellectual argument with you is also fantastic. You could do great stuff with them and maybe get to a different place. So I'd offer that gloss upon your question. Echo that completely. Yeah. And the, only, the, only, the only thing I'd, I'd add is uh, we're, we're just about to start a little project called the Social Life of Market Research. <coughs> which is the, to see whether you can trace what happens to any of this stuff that's done. Does anyone ever open it again? Does anyone ever talk about it? Does anyone ever email it? And so you could trace the social life of, of, uh, of I'm afraid, probably some fairly lonely, um, you know, dried, uh, kind of depressed pieces of research which never get seen again. Um, but to your point, it's like how much of it actually can oh, spread. Sure that, can it spread? Yeah, the, the COI have a fan, they keep all their research. They're really? one okay. place to keep all of it. And I think they have a thing for signing it out. So oh, you really? can see all that. Because I, I asked when I worked with a Charles Parker, I asked for all their research. And this huge box arrived, which fascinating had research I know my father had done uh, for them as a researcher, <laughs> which I had typed. And, there are, and uh, it's interesting, <laughs> the, the pages were still stuck together at the back. I was disappointed <laughs> to inform him. Uh, but they, you know, maybe that's just the library copy. But I think they keep a date. So you can sort of trace how much this stuff. So at least they at least keep it. That's a big problem. Most people don't even keep it. So. It's, uh, we're always, I would say, it's, it's, you know, if you don't know your history, you're destined to repeat it. But, you know, hell, you get to Charles another fee, so who cares, right? So. I do think, just, just to close that out, though, I do think there, are, there is a simple decision that you have to make. Do you think people make decisions on their own or in the company of others? I'll, I'll you I'll know, that's, that's, that's a basic thing. It leads you in very different directions, the kind of strategy you build, the kind of research that you do, the kind of media that you choose, the kind of KPIs you put in place and the kind of effect you're going to get. Can I fudge that, you. Mark? I mean, the, my answer would be they make decisions contextually within a context. Which is mostly And a very, very great people. part of that context, although a varying part, is other people. Yep. Yep. So it's quite unusual. I have found a category in which, the, uh, the, which is dominated by independent choices. Well, I've done a lot of analysis. Hemorrhoid cream? Something like that? Something no, too no. embarrassing to talk about? Uh, there'll be a, a copy of the book sent to one person. Who, if anyone in the room can tell me what that is. Any well, guesses what that one category is, where where the uh, it's the, the the format of the product is is the independent choice? I haven't found a single other one that I've looked at in many different categories. Sex. Not sex toys, but that's interesting, Howard. <laughs> you might make straight to that. <laughs> <laughs> Not suppositories, no. Investing. Sorry. Investing. Investing, no, no. That act that actually tends no, that tends to be more social influence than you'd imagine. Then we'd, then we'd like to think, that's why we go through that whole routine about have you looked at this, do you understand what you're signing? Anyone got one?